You're listening to Her Hacks Podcast, a podcast by women in cybersecurity for everyone. I'm Rebecca. I'm Lauren. And I'm Christine. Your resume is the first impression that a potential employer will see. This one sheet of paper is the most important piece of the job hunting process. It's a living document and a reflection of your core values. It's your story, a curation of you. But who are you? Exactly. Who are you? We've already talked about through this episode, you have established your brand. You know why it's important. You know how to do the research and you've built your list of companies that align with your goals and what works for you. And you know what positions you're interested in and you know what those positions are looking for. And that's great because you need to put all of that together to make that resume so that you really stand out and you get the interview and then you get the job. Yeah. So Lauren, Christine, and I are going to review our fellow co-host Connie's resume for you. So if you've never written a resume before, we're going to recommend starting with some kind of template. And this might be a little spicy, but at Her Hacks, we recommend familiarizing yourself with LaTeX. Now, LaTeX, spelled L-A-T-E-X, is a software-based document formatting tool. And it's globally used for formatting papers, books, scientific journals, and specifically resumes. You might already be familiar with it depending on your background, but if not, why do we like it so much? Well, it gives you the flexibility of separating your stylization formatting from your actual content in two separate files. So this means I can create design and formatting functions, but then I can just share that file with all of my friends that they could use. This also includes you. We have a customized LaTeX template for our HerHacks listeners to use for your resumes that we are going to link in our show notes. Now, there is a learning curve. So if you've never had to use LaTeX before, don't sweat it. We're not gatekeeping resumes to LaTeX. You can really use whatever you want. So we'll also include other resume building tools like Credible.io, Canva, and even a Microsoft Word document template. Please share with us any LaTeX templates that you kind of customize or create yourselves so we can showcase them and give you credit. Christine recently shared on Twitter this technical resume 101 hosted by April Christina Curley, and I registered for it and attended it. And it was a fantastic resume workshop that was a live stream on YouTube that is available right now historically on YouTube. She's a former Google recruiter who has reviewed thousands of resumes or up to a thousand maybe, and she really knows her stuff. So something she said in her workshop that I feel we really need to emphasize here is that your resume is either skimmed by a person or an automated system. If it's a person, it's very quickly done and the decision's gonna be made in six seconds and it's like swiping on Tinder whether it's accepted or not. So let me just remind everyone how important it is to make a good impression with your resume. All right, so we all have a copy of Connie's resume and it is in our beautiful Her Hacks LaTeX template. And the first thing I noticed is her name right at the top with a highlight of her work experience, education, external activities, awards and publications, and additional skills. And I think this is already off to a great start. Yeah, I agree. Just looking at it, I can very clearly see the different sections and my eyeballs can just kind of take in that she's got all of the important things that you would look for. And I can see with the bullet points listed under each, I can see that she's got a lot of work experience. Her skills are very easy to just pick out on the list. And then I like that she also included her awards and her publications. Oh, I actually wanted to mention something about her name. I recently decided to put a different phone number on my resume because you don't know like what happens with resumes when you upload them and what their data policies are. So I decided that, you know, if my resume somehow gets pulled somewhere I don't want all my personal information out there. So I put a different email address that I can still access and that I'll still see the emails for. But you're forwarding. Yeah. You're setting up forwarding for both the email and the phone number. Exactly. I set up forwarding emails and a VoIP phone number just so that I can kind of segment that stuff. And so if it does go out in the open, it's not all my personal information is out there because, you know, you're uploading it to these resume databases and it's like, where is it going? I don't know. 
I actually have done the same thing. I'm using my pseudo to do that. Yeah. And I can even pick the area code on my pseudo so I can make it still look like it's local from the area that I reside in. And it just forwards it to your actual phone number. So it's not like you're oh. really missing any of the calls. I'm going to tell everyone my area code on the podcast. It's 1337. Oh, so it's 337. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I picked that because I wanted it to be 1337. That was clever. Yeah, only no one's noticed, so... Is there a significance to 1337 that maybe I don't get or... (laughs) Yeah, it's like leet speak for leet. It's like hacker. Yeah. Okay. So if you're listening and you're new to cyber, don't feel bad for not knowing that or feel really awesome for knowing it because I did not. So it's not a big deal. It's probably every cybersecurity professional's like bank pin. So... (laughs) So something else to note, whenever I see education near the top to me that says like recent grad or somewhat recent grad, and then the lower the education goes on the resume to me, that means the further and further and further back they graduated. So if you're a recent grad or maybe you're a few years out of school, definitely feel free to put your education up top. But if you have more years of experience, you can put it down at the bottom because if you're like 10 years out of school, they really don't need to know what your GPA was. I would actually disagree. I would say if I'm looking at it, I would like to see it still towards the top. Oh, really? So I moved mine to the bottom once I was four years out of school because I was like, they don't really care. Yeah, I mean, I just kind of feel like it's part of like the personal section. So it's like the personal Mm -hmm. section, you want to have like your name, an email, and it needs to be a clean email, not your high school Trinity 69 email. Yes. (laughs) A phone number (laughs) that actually works. Yeah, don't have a like... A dumb voicemail message right. that's like an inside joke between you and all your friends. Because if a recruiter or interviewer is trying to get a hold of you and your voicemail box is full or you don't have a voicemail or they have to listen to a dumb voicemail. Yeah, like, what's up? It might reflect poorly on you and... First impressions. Yeah, it might set a bad first impression. Oh. So I don't know. I don't even have... A voicemail thing like I, I just have the automated lady that's like this phone number and then it like says my phone number yeah no that's fair another thing that connie also has is a link tree link and another thing that's nice to see is, is like hyperlinks in a resume like don't be afraid to hyperlink in your resume and the cool thing about like using link tree is that you can like list your linkedin profile your twitter profile like some of your professional socials i mean if you do post professionally on twitter don't necessarily link your private one or personal Twitter account. But those are also things that a recruiter is going to want to see, probably. Something I definitely like about this resume is that the main points of each work experience are highlighted. So it kind of draws my eye. So if I'm looking at tons and tons of resumes as a screener, and I know that I want somebody with Python, I'm going to be drawn to that box Python And that's really helpful for me to be able to want Connie as a candidate. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that she didn't just include hard skills. Like she's also included government standards, gap analysis, presentation delivery. So it stands out to me, one, because you can clearly see it. But two, it gives me the idea that she's done a lot of well-rounded work. Right. It shows that Mm -hmm. she has soft skills and soft skills you definitely want to highlight on a resume. Don't be afraid to highlight the soft skills as well with your technical ability. So for education, we see that Connie has a bachelor's in computer science. She included that she has a minor in data science. We like to see that. And that she's a part of a cybersecurity focal path. Now, I'm not really sure what that means particularly, but I do assume that she has some kind of cybersecurity education along with her studies. And she lists the dates at which she started and when she's expected to graduate because she has not graduated yet. She lists the location of where the university is. And then she lists the name of the university, which is University of Intelligent Her Hacker. Very, very prestigious. It's the best school in the universe. (laughs) Education looks good. I know we kind of debated where it should go on the page. I think on my resume, I have education. It's just like a smaller section, like the text might even be smaller. But I don't see anything here that really stands out to me of like, oh, she shouldn't have that or doesn't have that. I don't know that I included the location of the school on mine, but I think that's personal preference. I don't think that matters. And I think I now that I'm older, I just have the graduation date. I didn't have the full time. But again, personal preference. 
I don't think it really matters at the end of the day, just how I like to have it. And honestly, I probably ran out of space on the line. And so I just trimmed where I could. (laughs) Oh, true. I guess if you're still in school, you would probably have it the way that Connie has it. But once you graduate, you can just put like the graduation date. But I remember I've definitely looked at resumes where they haven't really explained it. And it's sometimes it's hard to tell. It's not clear. Like, are you still in school? Are you graduating from school? Are you going to get your master's degree? So have it clear the way that Connie has it with her graduation date so that if I'm a recruiter looking to hire someone for a full-time job starting tomorrow, I know that Connie's not ready yet. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And do you guys have any opinions on like keeping the date on your resume? Because I know some people are concerned that you might be able to do the math backwards and calculate age and there could be some ageism at play. Is that something that you guys worry about? I've never cared about it, but I'm just... Well, I don't think we care about it because it doesn't really apply mm-hmm. to us necessarily. Well, well actually, ageism yeah. can work in both ways, but no, because they're going to find out anyway. But I guess you're right. On that first impression, mm-hmm. they might make a biased judgment based on that. I've never actually really thought about it. To be honest, one of my friends that recently started at a company last year he didn't put his graduation year and he wasn't even senior yet at our last job. He was whatever the level before that was. And he was getting hired into a lead or a principal or something. And so I feel like he was intentionally not putting his graduation (laughs) information because he didn't want it to detract from the level that he was being offered, which I mean, more power to you, I guess. If you're able to take on that level of role, go for it. You don't want to get overwhelmed at the same time. But yeah, but who's to say that it's because he didn't put it on there that he got accepted? Well, I also year. think he was super under leveled at our last role. So like at the same time, he needed to have that jump because he was under leveled for a super long period of time. But I intentionally asked him, did you leave this off on purpose? And he was like, no, I just didn't think it was important. And I was like, oh, well, I guess it worked in your favor. Yeah, well, there you go. So do what you want. Another thing that maybe could have been included here is like GPA. So if you're like a new or recent grad, you're still in school. If you have a good GPA, I would definitely put it on there because they're going to find it. But if you're, you know, later on in your career, GPA doesn't really really matter. Yeah. Even April, I think the former Google technical mm-hmm. recruiter who gave that workshop, she even said that even as recruiters, they don't really assess like your GPA as necessarily an indicator of job competency, but yeah. it's still something that they look at. Yeah. I never put my GPA on because computer science, like software, that wasn't my major. And I had to take many levels of high level physics and that's not how my brain worked. So my computer science GPA was significantly higher Then like my graduating GPA, it was actually the computer science classes that brought my GPA up. And that was like my indication. Okay, switch fields, Lauren. Like it just didn't represent my academic story. And actually, there were a few times out of college where I might get a question of what's your GPA. And that's where I went back to my personal brand and my story. And that was I'm passionate about computer science. I do really well in these classes. I have all A's in these classes. I'm not as passionate about these that kind of pulled me down and having that story, not as necessarily a justification, but just to let the interviewer know who I was. But that's why I chose to leave it off because I didn't feel like it reflected me as a student or like my potential. It was just more of where my interests lie, and they were not in structural mechanics and strength of materials. Should we move on to another section, maybe? Yeah, let's go over like work experience. Christine, you made a comment about how you liked things being highlighted. Looking at the work experience section, like one of my initial critiques is I like the layout, but some of the bullet points are pretty long. They're multiple sentences. And they're not even. Yeah. One has three, one has four. I do think like different sizes between the bullet points I don't like, but also some things are very, very specific. Some of the language might be specific for that company. And so if there was a better way to generalize it out and hit the key concepts, like to me, I think this is a really good rough draft, but I would suggest like looking at this bullet point and trying to figure out the key point and maybe pull it out and maybe lose some of the detail without losing some of the importance. So like maybe taking out the 
specific protocol, unless that's something that's really important to the field. I evaluated the gap analysis and it did this, you know, like maybe generalize it a little bit more so anybody reading it can understand what she did in the role. I would keep the NIST acronym, but I would get rid of the other one, probably. Mm-hmm. The SP-800. No, the one in the second work experience one. There's like just a bunch of... Oh, yeah. sorry. If you could say like which one you're looking oh, at. Oh, yeah. I, I'm looking at government... Con- yeah. FFRDC. Yeah. FFR yeah, there's just like... I think that one, it's very acronym heavy. And so I think those are acronyms that are like more specific to that company. So like those can probably be taken out because those aren't known acronyms in the field, but like NIST is known in the field. So that one can stay. Yeah, I think that's exactly you perfectly summarize what I was trying to say. Other than that, I think it's really good. I really like how she highlighted that she has a publication in school. Yeah. I really like the way that those skills are boxed. And then she has additional skills at the bottom of the resume. How do you guys feel about putting Microsoft Office on your resume? So I think it depends. I was thinking the same thing. I personally would not put it on my resume. But I'm trying to think, is there, I'm not really sure Um, if there's a benefit for someone who has to do like, because she did list data science. So I don't know if like, maybe she's trying to say that she can like work with Excel. Oh, wait, you know what? Because she did work for a consulting place and consulting uses a lot of Excel. Right. So I don't know if, but maybe she could just highlight yeah, that. Maybe, or like Excel Not macros. Because yeah. I feel like Microsoft Office Suite, they have so many products Very broad. that you yeah. could get any kind of bonkers question on that. Yeah, I would highlight Excel. And then I feel like, I know I said we shouldn't be ages, but I feel like for our age, there is an expectation that you know how to use basic Microsoft. No, same. I'm like, girl, we all know how to use PowerPoint. (laughs) Yeah. It's funny because my sister works in healthcare and she works with somebody who is much older than us and she has to handhold through Microsoft products. So it's not a skill that everybody has, which is just weird to think about because it's so ingrained in us. But it is something that I feel like is just going to be an unstated expectation going forward. Oh, yeah. I remember I was the treasurer for an IEEE conference. And for some reason, even though I was the treasurer, I felt like I was only treasurer in name because there was really like an IEEE employee that would kind of control everything. And she basically just would always make me fill out this spreadsheet all the time. And like, I'd have to redo the spreadsheet over and over again. And it was very stressful and like a lot of back and forth all the time. But she would send me locked spreadsheets and I would use a visual basic cracker to unlock the spreadsheet. And she was like, you know, why are you changing these cells? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, listen, I've been using Excel since it came out practically. So you don't need to send me a locked spreadsheet. I know how to use it. Yeah. I think another interesting thing to add is that she does have like a skills dump of technical skills on the bottom under additional skills. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good because if there is a skill that you have that maybe you didn't develop in your work experience, it's good to just have because Connie is probably going to want to take this resume and tailor it to a specific job, Mm -hmm. a job requisition. So Getting those key words will help her like resume, maybe one, get past a recruiter or get past any kind of automated system that's like parsing and looking for specific key phrases or keywords. So I do actually like that she has that at the bottom. And I tend to do that myself. I employ that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you, any of you ladies do that Um, as well. I do have a skill, like a technical skills section where I list everything. Now that I have more work experience, I'm a little bit more selective about what I put in there because I know that if I put it on there, somebody can ask me a question on it. So I really try to only include it if I feel like I can intelligently speak to it. Like I know how to use Python. I've used Python before. But if somebody asks me a lot of questions about it, I might not necessarily be able to answer it. Whereas it came up, oh, do you have any Python experience? I've used it for side of desk projects. I know how it works. I could do more research if I needed it. And I feel like that is a stronger interaction than someone asking me a question I don't know how to answer. But I think right out of college, I think it's good to have everything on there because the interviews that she's going into, they're probably not expecting her to be an expert because she's probably done the research and is looking for a starting level or just above starting level position. I feel like including all of this 
I think it'll be helpful and it'll give her more to talk about. So I like that it's there. I just think it might shrink or expand over time based on how she grows in her career. Absolutely. I actually just pulled up my resume because I couldn't remember if I had put skills and tools in a separate section or if I had just listed them within my job experiences. And I actually did list the skills and tools at the top. And then I bolded ones that I felt even more comfortable with. So I have Ida Pro and Geecher together, but then I have Ida Pro bolded. I have Frida bolded because I've given a lot of conference talks on that. I have Python, C and C++ bolded. And then I have Java and JavaScript just on there because I'm pretty comfortable writing Java and JavaScript. But my language of choice is always like Python or C. And if I have to, C++. And then I put like iOS and Android, but I bolded iOS because that's what I prefer. So I don't know if this is like visually appealing, but looking at this, I didn't put every single debugger I've used. I've used tons of different debuggers, but I only put Frida and LLDB because those are the only two that are really relevant to my work. So like Lauren said, as you build more skills, you put the things on your resume that you want to be asked about. And if you don't want to be asked about it, don't put on your resume. I've used all the debug before, but I hate it. And I can never remember how to like make the window bigger. And I don't even do window stuff. So like, why would I put that on my resume? Yeah, I think it's interesting that you said you bolded the things that are important to you. I really like that. And I think I did the same where instead of how this resume template has like the skills in the work section very clearly boxed and at the top. I think I bolded them in bullet points and I agree it might not be visually appealing, but I think it is important to like drive home how you're using the skills and where you're using them and then putting them maybe in order of strongest to least strong because I feel like people will look at the beginning of the list. They might not read the whole list. I like that idea of ordering or emphasizing where you're strongest. Okay. Moving on to the external activities. Connie has an external activities list where she mentions that she was founding president of women in cybersecurity at University of Intelligent Her Hacker. So this is where she emphasizes her leadership skills. And then she also mentions that she was a CTF participant in the Pros versus Joes at B-Sides Las Vegas. And she lists the different tasks that she completed with the highlight of three different skills that she used. I definitely think that I like to see external activities, especially if you're a student. It's, it's nice to see that you're doing any kind of extracurriculars or that you're participating in any you capture the flag events or hackathons. You definitely want to have that listed on your resume. I wish that she had called out specific soft skills under the first one, the founding president of WESIS, because she does that for the capture the flag. And I think it's equally important to call out some of those soft skills because looking at it, you know, she started a whole new club. It has a large community of over 100 women. So I think she could make that stronger by pulling out those soft skills. And then it would also, the styling would match. Yeah, like that she would could, be my one feedback. I agree. She could put public speaking. Also, where's her hacks podcast on this resume? Yeah, true. Another thing that I've also seen um, sometimes with recent graduates or people who are in school is sometimes they'll do like a listing of different classes or course projects that they've done through their schooling. So that's another thing you can also put mm -hmm. on your resume is just any projects that you've done and just kind of write like what was the, like, the objective of the project. So I accomplished X as measured by Y doing Z. So some kind of quantifiable accomplishment. Yeah underneath of each different project. I would say keep projects short, but definitely highlight them. On the flip side, as somebody who's reviewed that, there are some projects that are in like required classes. And as somebody who has looked through a lot of resumes for intro candidates, there are a few projects that I know are for required classes because it's on every single person's resume who went to that school. But you well, think that's necessarily a detractor? Really detractor it's not particularly interesting because I know, and maybe it's also because I went to that school and there was like a very large pipeline. And that's part of why, like the way it was set up at the company is if you went to that school, you'd review those resumes. But it was like the intro 101 build a mobile app class. And it was a very simple app. And I don't think there's anything wrong with listing that on your resume, I guess especially what I, if you're doing career transitioning and you yeah. want to mention 
side projects you've done, MOOC projects, even if it's, hey, I just built a website. That's true. Listen on your resume. It depends on the job. I guess where I was going with that is like, if you're running out of space, maybe highlight the more unique ones or like the ones that you did at a higher level. But you're right. You probably aren't running out of space right out of college. So you probably should just list them all. But there was many years where we just had the same yeah. conversation like 25 times in a row about the exact same project. And it was like, whew, okay, maybe that's just me being old and bitter. <laughs> well, yeah. And I think it's also good to put this in perspective that when we asked Connie for this resume, she gave us a general resume. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure if she was using this for her internship or not. And I know that in April's The Technical Recruiter, former technical recruiter from Google's workshop that we are listing, she did mention that you can have like a master resume, which is literally everything you've ever done, including like volunteer work you did in high school. And then you want to always have a tailored resume for the job that you're actually looking to apply for. So that's like maybe where you wouldn't include, like you mentioned, Microsoft Office Suite, for example, because we're not really sure what job she's applying for with this. I mean, we're only just speculating. And don't feel like you have to reformat your whole resume. There are a lot of right ways to have a resume formatted, even though we had some disagreements about where things should be placed. I think that the takeaway from this is that you just want to make sure that your resume is readable, clear, and that you're highlighting things that you want the employers to notice. And I would also add to that concise. Your resume really should be one page because somebody's going to look at it in six to 10 seconds, they're not going to flip through multiple pages. Well, I think it depends. So I'm going to disagree with you there. I think if you're more mid-level and let's say you're applying internally, I think it depends. Mm -hmm. You don't want to like not list relevant experience that you have to keep it under a page. I think if you're early in your career, one pager is definitely what your go-to is. But I think if you're like an executive or doing senior level work, I could see it crossing two pages easily. Wait, let me look at mine. I think mine was two pages. I don't remember. I think I just closed it. I think it's really dependent on like the job. But if it's like entry level or you have less than X amount of experience. Oh my God. Yeah, I have two pages. Also, I lied to you. I thought that I put my education at the bottom, but it's actually at the top. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. It's come full circle. I'm the worst. Okay. See, this is interesting because I feel like I've always heard one page and what I've done is I've just let work experience kind of slide off my resume or I just put it as like a bullet point of like other places of employment and I just list the company and the dates and the role, but I don't have any bullet points about what I've done. So yeah, I I think I would like to learn more about that. So this is how I was taught to handle it. I was told that Even if you have more than one page, you're only guaranteed that they're going to look at the first page because they might only print the first page or they might print front and back and only look at the first page. They might lose the rest of your resume. So put the most important stuff on the first page and all of the extras can be on the additional pages. So I think I do have a master resume and I don't know if this was, I mean, this looks like I turned it into somebody, but I made so many iterations of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's such a personal time consuming. Yeah, but I put all my professional experience on the first page. And then I had additional undergrad and intern experience Mm -hmm. that went on the second page because I didn't want to not put my college experience Mm -hmm. in internships because technically that counts towards my years of experience. So I think I basically count for my years of experience. And I know everybody calculates this differently. But since I had three internships, I just count that as like one year cumulatively. So I want to add that on my resume. So I'm not like, oh, I have this many years of experience, but it's not reflected, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. And then at the very end of my resume, I have a listing of my conference presentations and publications. And then after that, I have a listing of different coursework and trainings that I've done. So I don't list my college coursework. I list conference trainings that I've done because in our industry, there's recon trainings and black hat trainings and all that stuff. So any of those trainings that I've gotten to take, I put on there to show like, hey, I've done this and I've learned from this. And I actually bolded, well, I only bolded two of them, but I bolded two of them. So. Well, and I guess you go to a lot of conferences, but you also give a lot of conference talks. So you probably have more 
in those extracurriculars or training, like you probably have a lot more than I would have, whereas mine is mostly education skills and work experience. So that makes sense. Right. Like it's kind of part of my brand. Yeah, exactly. I want to brand myself as like, oh, I love giving conference talks. Look at all the talks that I'm doing. Like when I come work for you, I'm going to give conference talks. Yeah. So that does make sense to me that you would need more pages to convey that because it's not just look at all of this experience. I have I'm overwhelming you. This is who I am. And this is like, all of Christine. So, okay, that makes more sense. And I think that also reflects our brands. So, and to mention that where someone might put conference talks and and Connie has a section for awards and publications. So that's really nice to see as well. And she lists like an applause award, but I mean, like if I'm not a part of that company, I'm not necessarily going to know what that means, but she also gives a nice little description that it was given specifically for leadership and quality work produced during her internship. And she does mention like different leadership. She mentions leadership in her resume a few different places. So that's consistent. And it looks like she was awarded for it. She lists at hyperlinks, actually. And this is something that's great. She hyperlinks her publication from her time at a public university. She lists that in there with the date of the publication. And then she also mentions that she was on the dean's list for the University of Intelligent, her hacker. She also gives a description on what it takes to make the dean's list underneath. So I think it's good that she lists all these things. Yeah. I agree. agree, Yeah. And the descriptions, I think, are very helpful because awards vary different places, even like Dean's List, very different places. So I like that she's giving that context and it's there. Yeah, I really like that. So I think we can wrap up this resume review. Yeah. Just a couple of points that we wanted to make sure, you know, keep it consistent. Always submit your resume as a PDF format. So your formatting doesn't get messed up when the recruiter or the system gets it in their own system. Try to keep it to one page if you're early in your career, over one page maybe for internal interviews or if you're mid-level in your career. It really just depends on how you're tailoring it to the job requisition that you're applying for. Try to hyperlink your relevant information. Another thing we kind of didn't mention, include your pronouns on your resume. So that's something that we could have seen on Connie's resume is her including her pronouns. Oh, and there's one last thing I wanted to highlight. So spelling, grammar, syntax. You will be rejected if there are spelling errors, if there's grammatical errors, any kind of syntax errors. So make sure that you use Grammarly or a writing center or your language arts teacher parent. Like make sure that someone else gets eyes on it because you will definitely miss stuff. So you do not want any of these errors. And it's kind of silly that the resumes will get thrown out for spelling errors or something like that. But that is the game. Yeah. And I also recommend just reading through everything out loud because you will get so in your head about the way you've written things that it's not until you read it out loud and you hear your bullet point that you're like, oh, that doesn't make any sense or that flows kind of awkwardly. So that's also just a really good check to make sure everything is flowing and it is readable. So you know who you are, you know what you want and what you're looking for. You also have a strong resume thanks to our Her Hacks review. So what do you do with it? This is where career fairs come into play. There's really three different types of career fairs that you can go to. There's academic career fairs that happen usually at your school. There's professional conference career fairs that happen at some big location, usually on site, co-located with some huge arena conference like Grace Hopper. And there's local company specific career fairs. So I'm going to go over all three of those. Your school career fair can sometimes be hit or miss depending on how many people are in your discipline at your school. If you're going to a really big engineering school, they might decide to have multiple career fairs and have an engineering specific fair or maybe even a computer science specific fair. So that's really helpful because you're going to be able to go to a career fair where almost all of the employers are looking to hire you and you're more likely to find somebody who's offering a job that's in your area of interest. My undergrad only had one career fair and it was basically catering to the entire school, which had tons of different majors and there was hardly any engineering companies that were there. And most of them were also hiring for that locality where I didn't want to live. So I didn't really get that much out of the career fair at my school. It was also a little stressful for me because my teachers wouldn't let us 
necessarily leave class. So it was basically an unexcused absence, which looking back, no. yeah, looking back, I was kind of frustrated because, you know, the whole reason why you're going to college is to get a job. It's for a job. Exactly. And people are getting in mountains of debt and you need a job to pay it off. So I don't understand why the teachers are so frustrated that people want to skip class to go to the career fair. Such different cr- experiences, Christian, because my school had two engineering specific engineer fairs every year, one in the spring, one in the fall. And they would like raffle off, teachers would raffle off, organizations would raffle off who got to help set up the booths so you could go and get extra FaceTime. And then it was just kind of expected that you wouldn't be in class for the two or three days that the career fair was going on. And companies from all over would come. But I guess... We had a much bigger engineering school and we are like a pipeline for Amazon and Microsoft. So they invest the resources there. I think that's the difference. Your school is a huge known Mm -hmm. engineering school. It's honestly a much higher ranked, much better engineering school than what I went to. So I honestly like sometimes wish that I went to a better engineering school because there's so many experiences like that where I'm like, oh, engineers were obviously not top priority where I went to school. (laughs) But if that's the case, and let's say your school doesn't have a very good career fair, you should definitely look for a professional conference career fair because those are super awesome and they're definitely catered to you. And you're going to feel like you're the center of attention and everybody wants to hire you. I really love the Grace Hopper celebration of women in computing because that's computer science specific. So there's so many different companies. There's also the WESIS conference, which is women in cybersecurity. And those conferences, again, there's so many employers who are looking to hire women who are looking to hire in your field, in your area of interest. So there's a lot higher ROI for that kind of conference. Even if that conference might be outside of your budget, I would recommend doing some research because I know a lot of really big companies will sponsor students, like no strings attached. You don't have to accept an offer. You don't have to have been an intern to just go to a conference like Grace Hopper. Yeah, every year there's a huge Grace Hopper scholarship. Some schools do sponsor their students depending on like if the department has money, but there's a Grace Hopper scholarship for students. There's WESIS student scholarships. So definitely apply. There's even a Black Hat Student Scholarship. That is more of a professional conference. So I didn't find very good job opportunities there at the time that I went because it's more geared towards vendors and vendors selling their products. But it was a really cool experience to network. And I did end up networking and getting a job from going to DEF CON. Also, If you're looking to find a job in the area that you currently live, some companies will advertise their roles locally and they'll even have small career fairs, especially in the area near where the government is. They'll have like government job fairs and things like that. And they're advertising their roles and looking for talent to fill them. So I would say to go to those career fairs if you're looking to stay in that area. But If you're not looking to stay in that area, don't go to those career fairs. Similarly, if you don't want to work in the area that you went to school, going to those career fairs may not be the best thing. Even at professional conferences, the year that I went to Grace Hopper, that it was in Texas, there was a lot of companies that were trying to hire for Texas, but I wasn't willing to move to Texas. So that was just a mismatch for some companies. So if you have a dream of moving to California or a dream of moving to New York, maybe you should go to RSA when they're hosting it in California, or I don't know if they hosted in New York, but try to find a conference in New York or something like that. So like I mentioned It's really important to go to career fairs because you can get job opportunities and um, you can just do networking. Even if you aren't looking for a job, I think it's really important to just kind of put yourself out there before your first interview. Because honestly, my first interview was really, really scary. My palms are sweating. My voice was shaking. I was terrified. I was wearing like a pantsuit. So I was super hot. Aw, what's so cute though? (laughs) I was in this like really hot 
gymnasium oh, thing because yeah. it was at a career fair. And like the more you talk to people, the more comfortable you'll feel. And I think that's honestly why I feel so comfortable just like DMing people now and talking to people now. Because when I first went to the career fair, I had no idea that people weren't interested in hiring freshmen. They weren't interested in hiring engineers. So I printed like a hundred copies of my resume. I killed a bunch of trees and I walked up to almost every single table at the career fair and I talked to everybody and it made me so confident and comfortable talking to people. And I tried to talk to people at the career fair every single year. So by the time it came to my senior year, I was actually really comfortable doing interviewing. And that was really important because I, by the time I was a senior in college and I had to interview for a real job, suddenly there's all these new feelings of pressure and like you're interviewing at places that you could only dream to interview at and then you get scared all over again. But because you've done practice interviews at places that maybe didn't matter as much, now suddenly you have all of these skills that you can just fall back on and you just feel a whole lot better. Yeah. And I would say too, when you're talking to these people, which is great, I would also try to connect with them on LinkedIn because then that way you have a way to stay in touch after you leave the booth and you can see where they go or maybe they're not hiring for entry-level jobs. But if you're connected with them, you might see a really great posting three years down the line that really piques your interest and you could reach out and post about that. And so I think that's a great way to build and keep that network too. Yeah, that's a good point. I feel like I've met so many people at conferences who are now part of my professional network and how I am now finding jobs later in my career. No, definitely. I tend to find jobs through like word of mouth or um, people that I know. Exactly. So if you're overwhelmed at the idea of going to a career fair, let me help you put together a game plan. First, you want to do some research ahead of time. I do not recommend showing up to a huge gymnasium that's really hot because the AC can't handle the number of people in it and you're wearing a full suit. So you're all sweaty and your hair is all messed up and you have no idea what companies are going to be there and you have to run around back and forth trying to find the booths you're interested in. If you're frazzled and uncomfortable and overwhelmed, you're not going to feel your best and you're not going to be able to set the best first impression. So try to find the map ahead of time and plan a route of the companies you're interested in. This makes it really easy so that you can just walk from table to table and not have to walk around the gymnasium a million times unless you're planning to make it leg day that day. And then you can talk to all of the companies you're interested in, get in and out and optimize your time. Some booths do tend to be more crowded than others. So make sure you plan to be standing in line longer for some than others, maybe try to go to any of the manga companies really early in the morning or first, or maybe try to plan your day so that you can wait for a lull. Also, don't dismiss companies you've never heard of because just because you haven't heard of them doesn't mean that they aren't the next really awesome thing. Small companies can also offer really unique opportunities. So it's something that you don't want to pass up and you might just make a really good connection. That being said, Sometimes there can be hundreds of companies at these conferences, especially something like We Sister Grace Hopper. And I get overwhelmed really easily. So I would actually say, at least per day, pick your top three companies because sometimes you end up talking for a really long time and maybe you want to go to conference talks or maybe you have to go back to class. Maybe you just need a break because you're introverted and you don't actually want to spend your entire day talking to people, just pick like your top two or three companies and try to talk to them. And that will make you feel like it's worth your while. Otherwise, you're just going to get overwhelmed if you talk to every single company, give every single company your resume. You're not actually interested in all of them. Maybe they all email you and then you have hundreds of unread emails from all of these companies and you're overwhelmed and you don't know what to do. So don't do that. I made that mistake my freshman year. I'd also say be flexible too. Like if your top three are these huge giant companies that have a giant line or two of the top three, maybe instead of waiting in line at that point, you go and you talk to a small company and then you come back and you get in line to like break up your waiting or things like that. And just try to like, as you go in and size up the room, stick to your plan, but also like be able to readjust your plan based on the whole conference atmosphere, because it can definitely be a lot. And 
it can be kind of hard to figure out where to get your foot in. And this is your chance to kind of do an informal interview before the interview. So we're going to talk more in the actual interviewing episode about questions that you should ask. But this is your chance to either talk to a recruiter or maybe talk to somebody who actually works at the company and find out what do they like about it? How long have they worked there? What do they do that's related to cybersecurity? What have they learned? Is there anything they'd like to change? I also recommend... Have your resume available. Probably you don't want to kill a lot of trees and have it printed out. And some companies don't even take resumes on paper anymore, especially after COVID. So be prepared to email your resume to them. And we're planning on making a QR code converter so that you can have a QR code conversion of your resume to make it super easy to give your resume to companies. And some conferences require you to upload your or suggest you upload your resume to their site ahead of time. Like I think Grace Hopper is one that you can upload it before you even get to the conference. So do a little bit of research on the actual conference itself to see if they have a way to handle sending out resumes. And then my last little piece of advice is, especially if you're going to Grace Hopper or Oasis, I know a lot of people say that thing about bringing a second suitcase for all of the free stuff. But remember, it might look bad if you care more about getting the free gear from a company than giving the person the time of day to hear about their job and why you should work for them. So make sure that you make a good impression at the companies that you want to work for and don't just like grab all our merch. So try to make sure that even if you're really only interested in the merch at a booth, you try to at least like be respectful and set a good impression and say hi to the people at the booth because I know that it tends to get really crazy and you just want to make sure that you're setting a good impression no matter who you're with or what you're doing, even if you're not interested in the company and you only want the Mickey ears or whatever they're giving out. (laughs) <laughs> That's such a good point because I've been on the opposite end of like working a booth and someone's just come up to me and been like, oh, this is where you get this T-shirt or you guys are giving out the screen cleaners or whatever. And it's so off-putting because I'm there and I'm just trying to just even say hello. And it's like, give me the stuff. Give me the stuff. That is a really, really good point. Right. Because honestly, it's like so many companies are there for like recruiting and I've gone there to recruit and then I've gone to like go get swag. And I kind of feel like by the end of the conference, a lot of the recruiting people are just like really pissed off and like annoyed, especially because people can be like really aggressive about getting the really flashy free stuff. So I don't know. I had like a rule for myself. If I cared about talking to a recruiter, I'd have to basically give up trying to get the merch because the lines for the merch were longer than the line to actually talk to the recruiter. And especially for big companies, the lines could be long for both. And I kind of wanted to set a good impression. So I didn't want to be like, oh, I want the t-shirt first or whatever. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but remember why you're there. (laughs) A job's worth more than a (laughs) t-shirt. Maybe next year we can all go to Grace Hopper together and like do a just because that's a big, easy conference to get a lot of this experience. And then we can do a follow up episode on conference etiquette. And I know you guys go to more conferences than I do. But I say we could do that now. But, <laughs> but it would be fun to yeah. all go to a big one together and just like specifically go to record and watch. And well, the last conference I went to was a software architecture conference end of February 2020. And there was probably like 40 booths there. But it was very different because it's for people who are much more established in their career and have decided they want to be architects. So like the big prize was O'Reilly gave away free architecture books. And that was like the thing that everybody oh, waited cool. in line for. And it was really cool. Yeah. I still have it. They're but expensive. that was the swag. And it was just a very different experience nice. than one that's of those swag. giant conferences like Grace Hopper, where there's thousands of people, hundreds of booths, and there's like sweatpants, there's all of that stuff. I haven't been in that scene in a very long time. Honestly, I probably have a panic attack since I have not been near people since COVID. <laughs> So thank you all so much for listening. I know we've covered a lot of topics today, but we have three her hacks that we want you to take away with you. Her hack number one, it's important to establish who you are. It's important to know your brand and have a solid elevator pitch for your different audiences. Her hacks number two, crafting your resume is very time consuming. 
but it's likely your first impression with the prospective company. So take that time. Her hack number three, don't get overwhelmed from the career fair. Make sure you plan your route to optimize it and pack a hairbrush just in case. Thank you so much for listening to Her Hacks Podcast. Follow us at Her Hacks Podcast. That's Her Hacks with an X for execute permission on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Don't forget to subscribe anywhere you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a future episode drop. And please leave us a star for each of our lovely hosts. That's five with an encouraging review. Click the join link for our discord in our show notes or at herhackspodcast.com. Let us know what you think about this episode and also engage with me and all the other hosts. Well, maybe next year, just like specifically go to record and watch and her hacks live on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Our Vegas residency. <laughs> <laughs>